Perovskite solar cells are smashing efficiency records and starting to hit the market. But what if the real future of solar is a material you've probably never heard of? It's called Kesterate, and new research suggests that it could match perovskite's efficiency without any toxic lead in the stack. That could mean even cheaper, cleaner, and more efficient solar panels for your home down the road. Scientists just simulated a version of Kesterate that could reach a 33.56% efficiency, brushing up against the theoretical limit for solar cells. The kicker? Well, Kesterate is durable, where perovskite struggles to survive the great outdoors. With new Kesterate efficiency records set this past year, could this underdog race ahead of perovskite and reshape the future of solar? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by Surfshark. So why should you care about Kesterite? Well, there are three reasons. The first, it's made from copper, zinc, tin, and sulfur or selenium, which are all abundant materials, so there's no rare earth elements, which means no supply chain drama. Second, it can be manufactured without toxic lead or cadmium, which matters both for your home and the environment. And third, it actually survives outdoors, where perovskites have some challenges there. In field tests in southern Spain, Kesterite cells barely degraded over three and a half months of direct sunlight. Now, solar is booming. 7% of the world's electricity now comes from sunlight, with 540 gigawatts of solar capacity added each year. But that growth depends on materials that are either expensive, toxic, or fragile. For example, those grid lines on a silicon solar panel, they're made with silver, and they jack up the price of each panel by a hefty 12%. Cadmium telluride is gaining market share in American utility-scale solar farms, but cadmium is toxic, and tellurium costs as much as platinum. That's made researchers pin their hopes on perovskite for powerful solar cells made from cheap, abundant materials. Which is why it's really too bad that perovskites degrade in air, heat, humidity, and even UV rays. It's kind of awkward for a material meant to stare at the sun. Oxford PV in the UK claims its new commercial panels have overcome these durability issues, but perovskite solar cells usually contain toxic lead, which complicates manufacturing and recycling. And that's why a whole new solar material called Kesterite is finally getting its time in the spotlight, or should I say sunlight. Kesterite is grown right in the lab from four or five abundant materials that I mentioned earlier. And depending on the mix, researchers give it a different nickname. But whatever the recipe, Kesterite has a high absorption coefficient. That puts it in a similar class as other thin film solar technologies like perovskite and cadmium telluride, which use light absorbing layers far slimmer than the silicon wafers in traditional panels. A solar panel made with a thin layer of cheap materials with no silver grid lines has the potential to be a lot cheaper. And because kesterite panels can be made without toxic metals like lead and cadmium, the environmental costs could be lower too. But the real question, is kesterite any good at staring down the sun? Yes. In field tests run by IMRA Europe in southern Spain, encapsulated kesterite solar cells barely degraded over three and a half months outdoors. When bare kesterite cells were kept under continuous indoor lighting for seven months straight, their efficiency stayed stable after an initial dip. Accelerated aging tests are still on the to-do list, but kesterite already has a reputation for stability. But there's one last box to check. It's the make or break for any solar cell, and that's efficiency. It's not just homes and businesses that are space constrained, utilities are too. Every last watt that's squeezed out of a square foot or meter of a solar panel helps. Now we just talked about how well Kesterite absorbs light in general, but it also is the way it absorbs light that has scientists paying attention. Like all light harvesting materials, Kesterite has a band gap, which is the amount of energy a photon of light needs to kick an electron loose and make electricity. Kesterite's band gap is wide. It's up to 1.5 electrovolts in comparison to silicon's 1.1 electrovolts, which is closer to the sweet spot for a single layer solar cell. That means it can absorb higher energy photons with less energy wasted as heat. So just how efficient could kesterite solar cells become? Well, researchers at Kafar El Sheikh University in Egypt used a computer model to optimize a kesterite device. They tuned the band gap, swapped out stack materials, and dialed in the thickness of each layer. Their results were published in Nature in 2005, and they showed that a kesterite solar cell could become 33.56% efficient at turning sunlight into electricity. That's shockingly close to the Shockley Quasar theoretical limit of around 33.7% for a single layer solar panel. It also beats earlier modeling studies that relied on toxic cadmium sulfide buffer layers to reach high theoretical efficiencies. So what makes it different? It's modeled with abundant non-toxic materials. The lone splurge was a gold vac contact, which the team plans to replace with molybdenum in future studies. 
If theoretical kestrate models promise near-max efficiencies, then the actual kestrate cells in the lab must be doing pretty hot, right? <laughs> Reality, they're still preheating. But before we get into why those kestrate cells are still simmering, let me tell you about today's sponsor, Surfshark VPN. In the past few months, I've attended a few conferences and between the hotel and conference Wi-Fi, I leaned heavily on Surfshark VPN to keep my browsing secure and private. I've been using Surfshark for what feels like forever now and get so much use out of it. Surfshark is a fast, easy to use VPN full of incredible features that you can install on an unlimited number of devices with one account. But that's not all. Even shopping services will sometimes gate prices based on your location, so you can change your location to make sure you're getting the best deal. They've also just launched an email scam checker that uses AI to spot phishing attacks in your Gmail. It works through their Chrome extension and catches suspicious content and malicious links before you ever click on anything dangerous. It's pretty cool. Right now they're running a special deal, so go to surfshark.com slash undecided or use the code undecided at checkout to get four extra months of Surfshark VPN. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk to try it out for yourself. I've been using Surfshark for years, and I love it. Don't miss out on this great deal. The link's in the description below, and thanks to Surfshark and to all of you for supporting the channel. All right, let's get back to what's actually happening in the lab with Kestrate. The highest decertified efficiency ever reported for a Kestrate solar cell is 14.3%, achieved by researchers at the Chinese Academy of Sciences in September of 2025. That's almost 20 years after the first Kestrite solar cell was ever made. So what's holding Kestrite back? Something called recombination. When sunlight knocks an electron loose in a Kestrite's crystal, it leaves behind a positively charged hole. If those charges travel to opposite ends of the solar stack, you get electrical current. However, if they meet again, they cancel out as heat instead of electricity. That's recombination, or at least a very simplified version of it. Recombination happens because copper and zinc are so similar that they swap places in the lattice, undermining the crystal structure. That creates deep traps where electrons and holes get stuck long enough to recombine instead of making electricity. Kestrite can also have vacancies at atomic sites in the crystal lattice, which is the semiconductor equivalent of a pothole. But the trouble isn't just inside the crystal. At the interface between the kestrite and the other layers in the stack, surface defects and poor contact between the layers can trap electrons, block electricity generation, and sink the solar cell's efficiency. You can see this in the modeling study. The solar cell's efficiency drops off dramatically with higher levels of defects at the kestrate titanium dioxide interface. The good news is the kestrate crystal can be healed even after it's already formed. In January of 2025, a team at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, broke the efficiency record for a cadmium-free kestrate solar cell by heat treating a fully formed device with hydrogen gas. Just a couple of months later, researchers at Shenzhen University in China showed that oxygen could heal defects by entering the crystal lattice and filling vacancies where sulfur should have been. Think of hydrogen and oxygen like a polish for scratched glass, filling in the imperfections to let the light, or more accurately, electrons, flow through. There's also a way to form a more efficient kestrite crystal right from the start. In June 2024, a group from the Chinese Academy of Sciences in Beijing added a tiny amount of silver and cadmium to the crystal mix, plus a little germanium at the back of the interface. These metals help the zinc, copper, and tin atoms settle into the right places in the lattice, creating a more perfect and more efficient crystal. The resulting kestrate stack reached a certified efficiency of 14.2%, a new record for a kestrate cell using a cadmium sulfide buffer layer. But if the aim is a solar panel made with just earth-abundant and non-toxic materials, then adding expensive silver, rare germanium, and toxic cadmium is not ideal. So these tweaks show that kestrate can be coaxed into a more perfect crystal. If the amounts added are tiny, alloying could be an ally in the search for a cheap, efficient solar cell. But there's more. The technique that secured the current kestrite world record skipped the germanium. In September of 2025, the same team at the Chinese Academy of Sciences added cheap, non-toxic chemicals between the layers of the kestrate stack that smoothed out the interfaces and filled the defects. Because one of these additives was slightly magnetic, it helped align nearby atoms and improve the electron flow. The solar cell hit a 14.3% certified efficiency, which is less than six points away from that 20% goal that would make kestrite commercially viable. And yes, it still used a cadmium sulfide buffer layer. This discovery shows that cheap and cheerful materials can deliver meaningful performance gains. What makes this latest kestrite record even more exciting is that it was achieved using a faster, cheaper production method. Because as much as efficiency matters, manufacturing costs are often the deciding factor for whether a solar cell will ever reach the mass market. In previous years, the best kestrate films were made by sputtering, 
which <laughs> sounds messy, but it's using plasma hot gas to precisely deposit thin layers in a vacuum. Energetic particles strike a target, causing a single atom to be removed at a time. These atoms eventually deposit on the surface to be coated, and that's not cheap or easy to do. Solution-based methods are 10 times cheaper and five times faster than sputtering. However, high defect levels and castrates made with solution-based techniques made the method, well, hardly the solution. Until now. The current Kestrate record holder, that solar cell that boosted to the 14.3% efficiency with a couple of simple additives, it was built layer by layer using a solution technique called doctor blading, <laughs> which sounds like a name of a new TV drama, but it also sounds very pricey. It's actually the same as slathering too much icing on a cake, then wiping off the excess to a fixed thickness. It's simple, quick, and low energy. It's a really common technique in manufacturing, including for thin film semiconductors. In other words, it's the kind of approach that could help bring Kestrate to commercialization. So when will Kestrate make it out of the lab? Well, Chengbo Meng, who led the team behind the current record, told Chemistry World in late 2025 that he sees Kestrate crossing the 20% threshold within five years. The problem is, I'm impatient, like right now. So I try to remember that the first solar panels were installed on a New York City rooftop in 1884, made of selenium with a thin coating of gold. They worked, but with an efficiency of just 1 to 2%. It wasn't until 1954 that Bell Laboratories rolled out the silicon solar cell, achieving 6% efficiency, and it took another 30 years until the University of New South Wales made a solar cell with 20% efficiency in 1985. Kestrate is still in its early days. Most of the work happening now sits at a NASA Technological Readiness Level, or TRL, of around a 3 or a 4 which is the stage where technology proves itself in a lab and early prototypes start to look like a real device. Perovskites were in the same spot about 16 years ago. We've watched them grow up in real time, climbing from those first lab experiments to something around a TRL of 8, with companies like Oxford PV shipping panels to customers right now. The time frame for solar innovations is compressing. If Kestrite follows a similar path, it could move from lab curiosity to commercial tech much faster than earlier generations of solar did. But what do you think? Is Kestrate the next big solar technology, or will this underdog struggle to catch up? Jump in the comments and let me know. You can also check out extended cuts of my videos over on Patreon. And speaking of that, these videos take a team to make, a team of humans, with real research, real interviews, real feedback from experts. There's no AI slop. If that matters to you, Patreon support helps a ton. The link's in the description if you'd like to join, but honestly, just watching like you are right now is awesome. So thank you. And check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll keep this conversation going. Keep your mind open, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next one.